Oh, you, are you going to turn it on? Better? So, I've gotten into making my own bread. You know, I've told you about you know, grinding my own wheat berries and all of that, making my own flour and so forth and things like that. And it's really more of a hobby at this point. But, but a lot of that comes from the idea of, you know, the bread that we eat in the store is just absolute garbage. My, my brother calls it glue bread because that's really what it is. I mean, it's just, it's just glue. That's, that's what it comes down to. So I've been trying to do some of that, and, you know, I, I've talked about some of my digestive issues. I can't eat like I used to, but I still like good food, you know. And, and I really think about food a lot, and I, you know, I made, listen, I made fried chicken last night with biscuits and gravy, you know, and sautéed cabbage, you know, like sautéed, good stuff. The other day, I, I made some, some pork chops with the, the, just salt, pepper, sage, and, and rosemary. Oh, man, just melt in your mouth. They were so good and tender. Am I making y'all hungry? <laughs> when you think about in this world that we live in, is food not all around us? And in our face, you know, we talk about uh, sexuality and things like that and how much that's in our face. Well, food's right there. I mean, we have whole channels that are dedicated to how you can learn how to cook food the way the the big chefs do and all that. And I used to sit and watch that, I'll tell you. And so tonight's subject is near and dear to my heart. It's something that I felt like that we ought to delve into, even though for many people, you, you might likely have never even heard a sermon on it because people just don't talk about it. Now, before I get into that, next Sunday morning, Lord willing... We're going to do a couple of lessons the next couple of weeks on prayer. And the reason why is because coming up in March, we're going to have a, a month of prayer. And I thought it'd be, I've had some questions about some different aspects of prayer, and I thought, well, let's do that. Let's talk about prayer. And so Sunday morning, Lord willing, we're going to talk about prayer. Now, the reason why I tell you that is because this lesson is, is going to be a multi-parter. All right, and so we're going to start this tonight, but then next week, and, and depending on what I can get in there next week, maybe even the week after, uh, we're going to talk about this subject. And I know that you're just dying to know what it is. We need to talk about fasting. We need to talk about fasting. Why do we need to talk about fasting? We need to talk about fasting because the Bible says so much about fasting. And yet we don't practice that regularly among the Lord's church. We don't really talk about it if we do. Don't, I, now I remember, I, I appreciate the songs that, that Jeff led tonight, and I'll just tell you, we didn't talk about these songs, and it made me nervous to think about preaching about fasting. Because back whenever I was in Rockwood doing the song leading, we didn't communicate, me and the preacher, about songs. And he preached on fasting one Sunday morning. And my invitation song was, All things are ready. Come to the feast. And so <laughs> whenever it came time for the invitation song, I announced a different song. I said, let's sing this one instead. <laughs> So I, was, I looked at Jeff's, Jeff's list and I thought, okay, this, this will be fine. This will be fine. But fasting, fasting. Now, tonight what I want to do is I want to look at the Old Testament because it, you know, in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, Paul said, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And there is so much truth to that. There, there is not as much said about fasting in the New Testament. There's quite a bit. 
But there's not as much said about fasting in the New Testament as there is in the Old Testament. And so if we're really going to understand fasting and what it is and what's involved and all those things, then we, we need to go to the Old Testament. And we need to see some of the things that are said about fasting there. Now, understand that I, I do not know about fasting, okay? This is, is as much of a study for me as it is for me telling you what it, what it says. I, it's something that I need to look into and learn about. I have done some fasting, but not at all for any of these reasons that we're going to talk about tonight, okay? It, it's had to do with medical things or, you know, losing weight or something like that. It's never been about spiritual things. And so this is as much of a journey for me as, as maybe it is for you in, in looking at these things. Turning your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. What I want to do first of all, now this this lesson is not even primarily my lesson. Uh, Mark Copeland's got a website out there where he's got a lot of his sermon outlines and study work and things like that. And he had a series of lessons on this, and I have adapted this from his studies. I don't have his... Listen, he packs his sermons full of Scripture, and I think that's a great thing. But there's no way we could get through all the stuff that he puts in a sermon. So I've, I've kind of gone through there and tried to pick up the, the more important things to think about and look about. So we're not going to be able to hit all of the different references uh, on fasting. I looked up, I tried to look up fasting, you know, as a, just a word search in the Bible. And it said like 238 times it was listed. But as I was looking through there, the first ten had to do with holding fast to the word of the Lord. You know, so it, it wasn't about fasting at all. So I just discarded that number and uh, so don't really... And matter of fact, here in Leviticus 16, what we're getting ready to read doesn't even say fasting. Okay, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. All right, so here we're talking about the Day of Atonement. And if you look beginning in verse 29... It says, this shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether a native or of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day, the priest will make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean and all your sins before the Lord. It is a, a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. Now, you didn't see the word fast in there, okay? And I understand that. But what we're looking at there is the afflicting of your souls. In some of your versions, you may have something different, like uh, I, I think the uh, New American Standard maybe says, well, I don't remember which one it was, but some of them say humble yourself. Some of them say something like denying yourself or, or something along those natures, okay? So it is the idea that you are denying yourself something, uh, that's what the wording is, is talking about there. But what it's actually talking about is it is talking about uh, the fast. And if you go over it, and I'm not going to go over it to uh, chapter 23, it's basically saying the same thing, basically saying the same thing. But understand what this fast was, this is the only time that it's been commanded in Scripture by God. This was the only fast that God said, you do this every year whenever it comes around. And that was to the children of Israel under the law of Moses. We don't live under that, and so we don't have that commandment for us. But, but understand, you know, we know... If you read much of Scripture at all, you know that they did a lot of fasting. They fasted for, for several things, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But this afflicting of souls, what we need to get from that is that this is fasting. We don't actually have the term fast in your Bibles until Judges 20. 
that is the first time that that shows up as being used for this process. But in uh, Psalm 90, or excuse me, Psalm 69 in verse 10, let me read this to you. It says, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. And so whenever we see that chastening of the soul, it is talking about fasting. Uh, there is some other uh, historical information that backs that up and, and, and shows that that's what it's talking about. In uh, Acts chapter 27, in verse 9, uh, we have a reference there to the fast. It says, now when, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because of the fast was already over, uh, Paul advised them. Okay, Well, the fast is in reference to the Day of Atonement. You see, that, that became known as the fast because that was one of the primary things that they would do surrounding the Day of Atonement. So I spent a little time on that one. I'm not going to spend near as much time on the rest of them, but I just wanted to show you that that uh, afflicting the soul, or however it is in your English Bible there, is talking about the fast. And that's the only one God commanded of them to do. But we know that they did fast for many other reasons, and you see that list of things that I have up there. Turn with me to Judges chapter 20. Judges chapter 20. We won't look at all of these references, but I want to look at a few. In, in Judges chapter 19, we have the episode of the Levite's concubine. And if you remember that, it, I'm not going to get into detail about that, but it was a horrible thing that happened in, uh, and I believe it was in Gibeah. Yeah, it, a horrible thing happened in Gibeah. Uh, the Benjamites would not give them up to be punished or whatever that is. And so all the nation of Israel decided to go to war against Benjamin, uh, go, going against their brothers. And that's what chapter 20 is all about. And what we see there in verse 26 is they held a fast before they went to, to battle against them. It says, Then all the children of Israel, that is all the people, went up and came to the house of God and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening, and they offered burnt offering and peace offerings before the Lord. And so because of this war that was upcoming, they went and fasted before the Lord. And I want you to notice the sorrow, the, the deep emotion that was involved in that, going up to the Lord and weeping at the house of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, and verse 6, uh, we have that, that has to do, you know, the, the Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines. Well, it, they had sent it back. And then this has to do with a battle directly after that. Uh, and it says there in verse 6, So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said, There we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. And so they held a fast there before they went to war against the Philistines. There is fasting uh, for the sick. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 16 and following, we, we read there, you remember the sin of David and Bathsheba and the child that was conceived out of that sin. And God struck that child with illness uh, that would be to the death. But David fasted, I believe it was for seven days until the child passed away. He didn't eat or drink during that time. Um, in Psalm chapter 35, verses 11 through 13, the psalmist says, Fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I do not know. They reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. And so he, there, there he was fasting for those who were against him, uh, you know, even whenever they were sick. They fasted whenever they were in mourning. 
in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 31 and 1 Chronicles chapter 10, we, we see where Saul and his uh, sons are killed, King Saul. And you remember that they were strung up. I mean, they were beheaded and strung up. Well, then you have these, these uh, valiant men who go up and take the bodies down and burn the bodies and, you know, and honor, basically, the, the king and his family. Uh, but it talks about them fasting. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 12, you read that David fasted for seven days in mourning Saul and, and Jonathan and, and their death uh, there. And then there were fasts that were, that were for sin. Um, Moses fasted uh, for the sin of Israel whenever he came down off of Mount Sinai after being up there for 40 days and 40 nights and receiving those stone tablets. And you remember what happened, the, the golden calf. You know, and so yeah, threw those tablets down and broke them, ground that calf down, put it in the water, made them drink it and all those things. Well, after doing all those things, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Didn't eat or drink for 40 days and 40 nights because of the sin of Israel. Over in 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse 27, we read about Ahab. You remember Naboth's vineyard? You know, and, and all of the crooked things that he did in order to gain Naboth's vineyard, well, he was confronted about that. And he was told all the things that God was going to do because of that, how he was going to cut off his, his family from being king in Israel and all these things. Well, Ahab actually fasted and, and put on sackcloth, tore his clothes, all the ashes, the whole nine yards... And he repented before God. And because of that, because he humbled himself that way, God said, okay, I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to do it while you're still alive. I'm going to, you know, it'll, it'll be after you're gone. They, uh, they fasted when they were faced with danger. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles 20. 2 Chronicles 20. <coughs> Here, uh, Jehoshaphat is coming, uh, well, it's getting close toward the end of his reign. And they are facing an enemy. And it says there in verse 3 of that chapter, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And so they fasted because they were in danger. And they were afraid of this enemy that was coming up against them. And you remember Esther? Yeah, I love to read Esther and study Esther. That is such a, a unique story to me. But you remember that uh, the, the occasion came that Esther needed to do something. She needed to go before the king. And Mordecai's letting her know, look, you're the one to do this. And so she finally says, okay, you need, you need to tell all the people to fast. They need to fast three days and three nights. Don't eat or drink. And she said, and, and me and my maidens are going to do the same here. And uh, because she's getting ready to go before the king uncalled for, which was dangerous. And you remember she said, if I perish, I perish. Uh, but that, you know, there's danger ahead, and so they're going to fast for that. There are many other occasions that you could look at in Scripture, those who are faced with danger, who are proclaiming a fast. And you know, oftentimes, it was accompanied by prayer. Oftentimes, they are supplicating God, trying to gain God's favor, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. The last one there, I don't have, I don't have any scripture to put with this because what this has to do, this memorial for events in history, these, these tragedies and things, they would often set up their own fasts because of some tragic event. Whenever Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed the temple... Well, on that certain day, they began having a fast every year on that certain day. Uh, whenever the, the temple was, um, there, there was something else with the town. There was two or three things, but it all had to do with that, 
that carrying away into Babylon, um, those things, they set up fasts for those things. And later on, they're actually ridiculed by God for that. Uh, not because they set up the fast, but other, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So there are some occasions for fasting. We, we see that they did that regularly in the Old Testament. Let's talk about the purpose of fasting. As we read those occasions, it might have been apparent in your mind some of the purposes for fasting. You know, they're asking for help. They're asking for God to help them with, with whatever situation that it might be. But when we think about fasting and the different reasons why people fast, yet some of them fasted just as a natural reaction to grief. Uh, and we do the same thing today, don't we? You know, whenever we have lost a loved one or, or something and it just, it just hurts so hard that you just don't want anything to eat. You, you just don't want to involve yourself with that. Most of, of the, uh, the occasions for, for fasting, the purpose for fasting, has to do with chastening the soul. Uh, and that has to, you know, it's talking about refraining from eating certain things and all of this stuff. But notice, notice the phrase, chastening the soul. This fasting that we are talking about is not about what you're doing to the body. It's not about that. Are, are, it does it affect the body? Yes, it does. Absolutely it does. But that's not the purpose. The purpose is chastening or afflicting the soul. It's not the body. There, that, that I read earlier in Psalm 35 and verse 13, but as for me, when, you, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting. Uh, humbling yourself, hum, you know, afflicting your soul with fasting, however you want to look at that. It is the idea of humility, humbling yourself, uh, making yourself approachable to God. Um, turn in your Bibles to Ezra chapter 8. Ezra chapter 8. Beginning in verse 21. So the children of Israel had been carried off into Babylonian captivity. This is the point where they are going back to Judah. And Ezra is getting ready. He's in Babylon and he's getting ready to make this journey with, with priests and, you know, the whole entourage, all of these things. Look what he says here in verse 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and, and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road, because we had spoken to the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all those, uh, those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer." But what I want us to notice there in, that, in those verses, in verse 21, he says that we might humble ourselves before God. The idea many times of their fasting was to humble themselves before God. And why is that important? When in Isaiah chapter 57 in verse 15, and there are other scriptures that we could go to to, to show this, but it says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So the idea is that if we want God to help us, there has got to be some humility. We've got to humble ourselves. Turn with me over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. I'm 
I'm going to read beginning in verse 6. James chapter 4 and verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. That's the idea that we're talking about. Whenever they were fasting, that's what they were trying to do. And all of those things were involved in that. It's the idea of cleansing. It's the idea of purifying. It's the idea of humbling yourself before God. Making yourself humble in His sight. So that He would hear whenever they would entreat Him. Now, we understand that God hears us, you know, whenever we ask Him things. But... There is something different about fasting that helps in this process. And that's what we're seeing from the scriptures in the Old Testament. And I'm not suggesting that this means that we absolutely... I'm not going to answer that question tonight. Do we need to fast as Christians? We're going to talk about that in later lessons. But it makes us think, are we really devoted to God enough that, that we would care to go through these processes in order for us to draw closer to God. We really ought to think about these things. All right, so let's go on. We've got, if I can get, there we go. Let's talk about the process of fasting. What is actually involved in fasting? How do you go about that? Um, some say that fasting could be, you could, you could look at fasting as refraining from anything. Uh, I, I have heard people talking about, you know, they're having an electronics fast. You know, they're not going to have their phone, be on the computer, tablet, or internet, anything like that. They're just going to have a fast maybe for a few days from all, all that technological stuff, you know. And that's fine. That's great. You know, maybe there are some other things that you might uh, take a fast from, you know, deny yourself of. But whenever we're looking at Scripture, it's talking about food. I, I have not come across a scripture that has, has been fasting about anything else except for food. So understand that I understand there are those other ideas out there, but as far as what we're looking at, it has to do with abstaining from food. The normal fast was to abstain from food and not water. Okay, and, so, and, and I don't remember, some of y'all that have been in the medical field, I don't remember how many days it is you can survive without food. You, you can't survive as near as long without water, but you can survive without food a long time. It's, it's a long time. Uh, but the normal fast had to do with abstaining from food, but not abstaining from water. There was a partial fast over in uh, Daniel chapter 10, Verses 2 and 3, it says, In those days uh, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So that's what we would call a partial fast. He still ate and drank, but he didn't have any of that good stuff. You know, the cheesecake. The hot fudge cake, the you know the fried chicken. Uh, you know, he didn't have the delicacies, you might say. Uh, he refrained himself from all of those. And then you've got the absolute fast, which would be kind of an extreme fast. Uh, you would be eating no food, drinking no water, uh, and we have examples of that there in Nineveh. Uh, you know, you remember Jonah going and preaching to the city of Nineveh and told them, if you don't repent, you're all going to perish. Uh, and the king proclaimed a fast. And it wasn't just a fast for the people. It was a fast for the animals too. We're all fasting. There ain't nobody eating or drinking. And it doesn't say how long the, the fast was, but, but that, that was, uh, that's what you call an extreme fast. And then in Esther chapter 4 and verse 16, 
Uh, it says, Go gather all the Jews who are present at Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so there again, that's an extreme fast. We have other uh, examples of that. Uh, well, I, I read to you earlier or told you about Moses, you know, fasting for the children of Israel because of their sin. He, he didn't eat or drink. For 40 days and 40 nights. Now, there's got to be some hand to God involvement there in that because uh, our physical bodies can't take that. But, but that's what he did. He fasted for that long of a time. And that brings me to the idea of the length of fasts. The Day of Atonement was a one-day fast. From sunup to sundown, they would not eat any food. Whenever you got to sundown, then they would eat. And I believe that that is where we get the term breakfast from. If, I, if I'm right in my remembrance, they broke fast. Okay, and so it is that. Of course, we do that of a morning, but, you know, that's, that's a different thing. Um, but in Judges chapter 20 and verse 26 that we read earlier, uh, notice that it says they sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Uh, it appears that maybe what they did there was they fasted until evening, and then they offered those burnt offerings and sacrifices to the Lord because a lot of times they would be partaking of those burnt offerings and sacrifices. So uh, that may not be what that is, but that's, that's a possibility there. But remember, that one was commanded. That's the only one that was commanded. Uh, there were shorter uh, fasts that they did. You know, some of them just fasted at night. Uh, I, I can remember having to go and, and uh, do a medical test, and you have to fast for so many hours, you know. Well, the best time to do that, schedule that first thing in the morning so that you can go to bed. <laughs> and that's your fasting period, see? Uh, they worked that out really well for you. Uh, but then there were longer fasts, like three days, seven days, 40 days, and 40 nights. Uh, we have that example in Moses. I believe Elijah did that at one point. And then in Jesus. Jesus also did that. So... Uh, there's a lot in the Old Testament about fasting, and I realize that that's, you know, that's just all information, and I'm just kind of throwing that all at you, but I felt like it's important to, to get that in there because we can learn from these Old Testament examples. Uh, you know, fasting, when you look at those, and you know, we read through those different occasions, you understand that fasting is a very solemn event. It is something that is very thought out and very purposeful. And they took a lot of time to think about those things. Fasting will do nothing if done wrong. If, whenever you get time, go read Isaiah chapter 58. Okay, because he attacks their fasts very much right there in that chapter. Turn with me to Zechariah 7. Zechariah 7. I mentioned earlier the, uh, some of the occasions of fasting had to do with events that happened and they would set up their own fasts. Well, here in Zechariah 7, he, he refers to those fasts. I'm going to start there in verse 1. I'm just going to read through this. He says, Now in the fourth year of King Darius, it came to pass that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, Chislev, when the people sent... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Sherezer with Regum Melech and his men to the house of God to pray before the Lord and to ask the priests who were in the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets saying, should I weep in the fifth month and fast as I have done for so many years? And that's the fast that he's talking about. It was those fasts that they had set up during their time of Babylonian captivity. And so now they're asking, you know, do, do we need to still keep doing that? You know, they're asking about that. 
Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, Say to all the people of the land and to the priests, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months during those 70 years, did you really fast for me? For me? You see what God's doing. See, you, didn't, you didn't do those fasts for me. We could say a whole lot about all that, but you know, God recognizes whenever we don't fast the proper way. He recognized those fasts had to do with their own thoughts and their own desires. He says in verse 6, When you eat and when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous and the south and the lowlands were inhabited? He's really chewing them out. He is saying, look, you're asking about this silly thing. Why didn't you obey whenever you had it good in Jerusalem before? And I had to send Babylon in there to take care of things. Why didn't you obey then? Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice, show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. But they refused to heed, shrugged their shoulders, and stopped their ears so that they could not hear. Yes, they made their hearts like flint, refusing to hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by His Spirit through the former prophets. Thus great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it happened that just as He proclaimed and they would not hear, so they called out and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations which they had not known. Thus the land became desolate after them, so that no one passed through or returned, for they made the pleasant land desolate. What I think we need to learn from this is what God is saying. You know, these fasts that we're talking about, we see the importance of that but it is so much more important to obey the will of God. It is so much more important to follow His commands and to do His will in everything that we do in our lives. And that's what He's telling them. You came to fast. You came to do all of those things, but you weren't doing the things that I wanted you to do, justice, helping the poor, and all of those things. You were not doing what you should have done. And so he didn't hear their cries. He didn't pay any attention to their fasts. Again, the point of this lesson is, is informational. Uh, we'll get more into you know, what this means to us next week, Lord willing. But we should try to learn. And that's what we're here for, and that's what we need to understand. That's, what, that's why we get into Bible study, is so that we can learn these things, and how do they apply to us? We need to be learning what it is that we can do to please our God. And this went actually much longer than I anticipated. But I think it's a good study. I think we need to get into these things. For us today, we don't live by this Old Testament commandment. Okay, We'll get into the New Testament part of fasting next week. But we do live by those New Testament commands, and we do need to obey those commands if we are going to be pleasing to God. And we need to obey all of them, and not just nitpick this one and that one. And so if fasting is one of those things that is commanded, then we need to be thinking about getting on it. There again, we'll answer that question in a later lesson. This evening... We are to be about pleasing the Lord. And if you have not obeyed the gospel, you have not pleased the Lord. You are not a child of God. And so I would encourage you, if you are here tonight, if you're listening online, please do something about that. And here's what you need to do. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you need to repent of your sins. You need to change your mind about sin, that you're not going to live that way any longer. And you need to let that lead to a change of action. You need to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. 
and then you need to be buried with him in the watery grave of baptism where you will come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ to take away your sins. And he will add you to his church. This evening, if you're ready to do that, we're ready to assist you in that. If you're here tonight and you have obeyed the gospel, but maybe there are things in your life that need to be fixed, or maybe you just need prayers of strength, whatever it might be, if we can help you with that, we would love to. Whatever it might be tonight, will you please just come forward while we stand and while we sing.